Hello everybody, this is Eric White with OpenXMLDeveloper.org. In this screencast and in the next screencast, I'm going to give you a super fast end-to-end -end overview of what you need to know about XML in order to do OpenXML development. I've mentioned before that I have a couple of target developers in mind as I'm designing these screencasts. And this target developer is a competent object-oriented developer, but maybe hasn't had exposure to the various concepts in functional programming. And therefore, I covered the basics with regards to functional programming. Even though lots of developers out there already have had exposure to that, there are plenty of developers who have not. And further, I'm actually also targeting this towards, as an example, a friend of mine who needs to do some really fairly elaborate OpenXML development and also needs to understand all of the ins and outs of XML in order to do the type of development that he needs to do. I've been meaning to do a couple of screencasts on XML for a long time. I've kind of delayed because there's all kinds of good content on XML out there, but I think it's worthwhile for me to spend enough time to do a couple of 15 minute screencasts on XML. And if you don't know all of the important semantic aspects of XML, you can watch these two screencasts and you can understand exactly what you need to know in order to do OpenXML development. So just to set context, here we're looking at an OpenXML document in Visual Studio. This is using the OpenXML package editor power tool for Visual Studio 2010. And if we open up the Word node in this OpenXML document, we can see document.xml and I can open that. And inside there, we can see a whole bunch of XML and we see this W colon document, that's the root element of this particular XML document. We can see all of the various namespace declarations for this XML document. And we can see the child element of the document element, and that's the W colon body element. And that has children elements of W colon P, which are the paragraph elements, and so on and so forth. So what is XML? XML is a text-based file format that can contain structured or unstructured data. And we'll talk about that more later on in this screencast. And there are a set of rules regarding XML. I have to tell you, it's not a big set. We're going to cover just about every rule that there is to cover in two screencasts. One point is I'm not going to explain every possible aspect of XML. In particular, DTDs are on their way out and OpenXML doesn't make use of DTDs, so I'm going to ignore everything associated with DTDs. I'm going to focus on what you need to know in order to do OpenXML development. So let's talk about elements and attributes first. I'm going to create an element here and I'll call this element the root element. And you can see here that this root element has a start tag right here and it has an end tag right there. So the start tag is root that is surrounded by a less than sign and a greater than sign. And the end tag is the less than sign and the greater than sign surrounding slash root. I could put a little bit of text in here. And this is a complete valid document. We have a root element, we have a little bit of text in that root element, and that itself comprises a valid XML document. But elements can, of course, contain other elements. So under here, I can define a child element and I can have some text in that child element. And that also is a valid XML document. One important point is that an XML document, a valid XML document can contain only one root element. So if I were to go into this document and I put in something called root two, we see in fact 
the XML editor in Visual Studio, it puts us a squiggly up here, and it tells us that the XML document cannot contain multiple root level elements. That's a basic rule of XML. There's only ever one root level element. Now let's chat about attributes. An attribute is a name value pair that is associated with some particular element. And so that means it goes inside of the less than sign and the greater than sign for the start tag of that element. So as an example, I can say attribute one is equal to one, two, three. And I could say attribute two is equal to four, five, six. And so there I have defined two attributes. One point about attributes is that you're not allowed to have two attributes in an element that have the same name. So if I come in here and I put attribute one is equal to ABC, we get this squiggly and it tells us that we have a duplicate attribute ATT1. So only one attribute with a given name for an element. One interesting point about XML is that these attributes are technically supposed to be sorted. That per the XML standard, the attributes should occur in alphabetical order per their names. But there is an interesting thing is that almost no XML processors and no XML editors enforce this. So for instance, here I can cut that attribute and paste it in and Visual Studio doesn't complain about this. And in fact, you can create an OpenXML document that has attributes out of order and Word or Excel or PowerPoint will happily open the document. It's not something that I pay attention to in my real world development of OpenXML examples or of OpenXML programs. Another point about these attributes is you can use single quotes or double quotes here. So I can change this to a single quote for that attribute that has the exact same contents as if I were to use the double quote. Now, one good point about this is that you can use an attribute that has single quotes around it in order to put an attribute that has a double quote as part of its value. And you can use an attribute with double quotes to include a single quote within an attribute value. This is convenient, but there are also other ways where you can specify a single quote and double quote as part of the content of the attribute, regardless of what you actually used when serializing that attribute. In other words, you can include a single quote within an attribute that has a single quote, and that's by using an entity. We'll cover that in a bit. Final point about attributes is that attributes are always interpreted as strings. In other words, when you use an XML programming API to get the value of an attribute, you generally get the value out as a string. You might have a schema definition that defines that attribute to be a number, and it might be invalid to have anything other than a number in that attribute. And that's something that's enforced on top of the XML syntax that per the XML syntax itself, attributes are comprised only of strings. So here we've shown a little XML document. We have a root element, we have a child element, we have a number of attributes and so on and so forth. What we often call a particular set of element names and attribute names is an XML vocabulary or sometimes this is called an XML dialect. So in other words, word processing ML is an XML dialect for OpenXML that enables you to store Word documents. And spreadsheet ML is an XML dialect that enables you to write a spreadsheet document. So when we talk about a vocabulary or when we talk about a dialect, what we're talking about is the complete set of element and attribute names that comprise that XML so that those are the things that you use to construct an XML document out of. Let's talk about these XML names in more detail. These XML names may be in something called a namespace. You can think about namespaces in the same way as with, for instance, C Sharp or Java. This is a way to qualify a name so that it doesn't conflict with other names. Namespaces often 
look like URLs. In other words, the namespace often has an HTTP colon slash slash something. Let's go look at that OpenXML document again, and we'll take a look at those namespaces. And here we can see most of the OpenXML namespaces do follow the form of a URL. They have HTTP colon slash slash and then some particular long string that is guaranteed to be a unique string. There are exceptions, for instance, these URNs and so on and so forth, but there's nothing that actually requires that these namespaces be URLs and further, these URLs don't need to actually point to some real location on the internet, although often they do. If you go and pull up the URL for a particular namespace, you can sometimes find additional information about that particular namespace. Looking at our example again, here in this particular example, this root and this child, they're actually in no namespace. So a name can be in no namespace or it can be in a namespace. In one sense, the no namespace namespace, is it's sort of a uh, magic namespace that says that this is no namespace. Next point is, let's go back over here and look at our OpenXML document again. And what we can see here is that namespaces can have a prefix. So right here, we see the XMLNS colon W, and that's set equal to this namespace of HTTP colon slash slash schemas dot open XML formats dot org slash word processing ML slash 2006 slash main. And what this does is it defines this prefix of W to be in scope for that particular namespace. And so therefore, down here in the remainder of the document, whenever we see the W colon and a name of an element or the name of an attribute, that means that that name of that element or attribute is in the namespace as defined in that namespace declaration. One more point about these namespace declarations and these namespace prefixes is they are scoped from the element that they are in. So in other words here, we can see this XMLNS colon W is equal to a long namespace, and that is in the scope for the document element itself up here. So we're allowed to use that W colon prefix in the document element because it is defined as a namespace in the document element itself. When defining these namespaces, we see this XMLNS string, and this XMLNS string is a special keyword that is defined for XML that enables us to define namespaces. In some cases, this XMLNS is used almost like it's a local name. In other cases, it looks kind of like a prefix. In this particular example, the XMLNS looks like a prefix but it's not really a prefix. It's actually a special namespace declaration that kind of looks like an attribute. But key point about this is while namespace declarations look like attributes, they kind of have the same syntax. They have some name is equal to some value and that value is in a string. They kind of look like attributes, but they're not attributes. They are technically a completely different entity in the XML. Now you'll find in certain XML programming APIs that they conflate namespaces and attributes. As an example, in linked XML, these namespace declarations are actually in the XML tree as X attribute objects. The only thing is they have a Boolean on those X attribute objects that this Boolean is called is namespace. And if it is a namespace declaration, that Boolean will be set to true. And if it's an ordinary attribute like this W colon RSIDR, it, that is namespace Boolean will be set to false, of course. Now let's look at another part in this OpenXML document. And here we see an XML document and up at the top we see a namespace declaration that has XMLNS equals some value. 
So you noticed in this other document, we had XMLNS colon W or XMLNS colon W14 or so on is equal to some value. And that's defining a prefix. But in this app.xml, we have this XMLNS is equal to some value with no colon and no prefix following it. And that is how you define a default namespace. If you define a default namespace, then the element that contains that default namespace declaration, if that element doesn't have a prefix, then it will be in that namespace. And further, any elements that are a descendant of that element, if they don't have a prefix, will be in that default namespace. There is always only one default namespace in scope at a time. Now, technically, it doesn't matter whether we use a default namespace to put an element into a namespace or whether we use a namespace with a prefix to put an element in a namespace. When we're reading that XML document, all we care about is what is the namespace of that element. It doesn't make any difference with regards to the content of that element, whether it was serialized as a default namespace or as a namespace with a prefix. So when we have this namespace and a name, let's talk about what those are. The name itself is called a local name. So this body is the local name of that element. This P is the local name of the paragraph element. And the namespace is represented by the W and that then is using the prefix as defined by the namespace declaration up above. And this combination of a namespace plus a local name is what's called a qualified name. And this is often called a queue name in XML parlance. So an element or attribute always has a local name. It might have a namespace name or it might not. And if it is in a namespace, it might or might not have a prefix depending on whether it is serialized using the default namespace or not. Okay, now we're gonna look at a slightly different document here. And this XML document, it has an interesting attribute down here. It has this special attribute, XML colon space is equal to preserve. And if we go up into the list of namespaces, we look up there and there isn't a namespace with a prefix of XML. In fact, this XML prefix is a special prefix that is defined by the XML standard. And when you have this XML prefix, you don't need to actually define it in a namespace declaration. It's automatically in scope and it's always in scope. And there are a couple of attributes that you will commonly see. And one of these is this XML colon space and the valid value for that attribute is preserve. And when you have that XML space equals preserve, then when you look at the contents of that element, you can see here where the contents are O-N space and that XML space equals preserve tells the XML processor to not throw away that trailing space. So if we didn't have that attribute XML space equals preserve, and we saved this XML document and we opened up that document in Word, that space would be kind of magically deleted from our document. There is also another attribute that is there in XML, and that's the XML colon lang. In other words, this is an attribute that lets you specify the language that these elements and attributes are going to be in. And this is a value that is not used by OpenXML. So we're not going to delve into that particular special attribute in this screencast or in the next one. But suffice it to say that there are just a couple of special attributes that you will commonly see that have this special prefix of XML. We've talked about default namespaces, I'm going to go into this little document and I'm going to define a default namespace and I'm going to talk about one difference about how this default namespace affects the elements and attributes that it applies to. So I am going to write XMLNS is equal to 
http colon www.adventureworks.com and so this brought a default namespace into scope. So with this document, this root element is in that namespace that I just defined. And in fact, also that child element is in that default namespace because that default namespace is in scope. While if an element has no prefix, and if there is a default namespace, then the element is in that default namespace, the exact opposite is true with attributes. If an attribute has no prefix, it never goes into the default namespace. It always goes into no namespace. If we wanted to put these attributes into that same namespace, the only way that we could do so would be to create another namespace declaration and have that namespace declaration use a prefix and then use a prefix with attributes. So let me show you, I could go So there I've defined a prefix of aw for that exact same namespace. And now I could come over here into this attribute and I could put that prefix onto that attribute. And at this point in time, that attribute name now has the namespace that we declared. So if you're using a default namespace and you want to put the attribute into that namespace, then you have to explicitly declare a prefix for that. In general, this makes sense. We don't often need to put attributes into a namespace when we're designing an XML vocabulary. I'll remove that prefix. So even though these attributes, ATT1 and ATT2, don't have a prefix, in a sense, they're in the prefix of their element. In other words, you couldn't get to that attribute without first going to the element and you couldn't get to that element without pulling that element up, also referring to its namespace in some form or another. So you, you couldn't find that attribute without knowing the namespace of the element. However, there are some of the XML vocabularies in OpenXML follow this rule, such as presentation ML. It doesn't put attributes in a namespace. Also, spreadsheet ML doesn't put attributes in a namespace. But word processing ML does put attributes in a namespace. You can see this w colon rsid attribute is in the w namespace. If we drop down into the section properties, we see the w colon w and the w colon h attributes here. They're in the w namespace. In certain ways, this makes development with word processing ML easier. And in another sense, it just doesn't matter. It's in the standard. This is the way you write word processing ML. You put the attributes in a namespace. And when you are writing spreadsheet ML or presentation ML, you don't generally put attributes in namespaces. Well, this is the end of this first of two screencasts on XML. In the next screencast, we're going to dive into the idea of data-centric and document-centric XML documents. We're then going to look at mixed content. We're going to look at all the types of nodes that you will find in XML. We'll examine the idea of an info set in detail and what is an info set in the context of XML. So until next time.